Hi, everybody. Hope you're well. Today, I will read from a book titled Architectural Ethnography by Momoyo Kaijima, Lauren Stalder, and Yu Izeki, published by Toto. Momoyo Kaijima wrote, I will begin this story in 1969, the year I was born, but also the year that Rainer Bannam's The Architecture of the Well-Tempered Environment, Bernard Rudowski's Streets for People, a Primer for Americans, and Philippe Boudon's Social Architectural Study, Pessac de l'Ecobosier, were all published. Around the world, architecture was taking a postmodern turn. Japan was in the midst of a period of intense economic growth. My own neighborhood of Yotsuya, close to the main venue of the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, was being transformed by rapid urbanization. When I started elementary school, its main street was a two-lane road lined with two-story shops, some of them owned by parents of my classmates. Then the road was widened to make four lanes and the little shops had to close. One after another, my classmates and their families moved away. Around the same time, our own family home was demolished to make way for a new apartment building. All that remained of the place where I had spent my early years was a cherry tree beside the road. My grandfather used to live with us. He would wear a kimono at home, but go to work in a suit and tie, the embodiment of the mixing of Japanese and Western cultures in our daily life. Children's television shows reflected a similar cultural fusion. The most popular animation series were Once Upon a Time in Japan, based on traditional folk tales, and Hayao Miyazaki's Dog of Flanders and Heidi, Girl of the Alps. As more Japanese started to travel abroad in the 1970s, more books were published in translation. Stories like Anne of Green Gables or Little House on the Prairie set my imagination roaming around the world. Another book avidly devoured when I was a little older was a scenographer's travel diary containing detailed sketches of a journey to India. By the time I started to study architecture in the late 1980s, Japan's bubble economy was at its peak and real estate speculation was rampant. I remember newspaper reports of a damp truck deliberately crashing into an old house near our neighborhood. Skyrocketing land prices meant that any existing building on the site was not worth a single yen. How had it come to this? At every opportunity, I walked around the city, trying to witness the changes with my own eyes. And again, I read books, searching their pages for the root causes of this situation. There was a flurry of publications on Tokyo around this time, partly in response to its rapid urban transformation. A 1987 pocket edition, Wajiro Kon's Modernology, published in 1930. Introduction to Street Observation Studies, 1986, by Genpei Akasegawa and the Street Observation Society. Billboard Architecture, 1988, by Terunobu Fujimori. A Spatial Anthropology, 1985, by Idenobu Ginai, among many others. These books inspired me to imagine different flows of time in the changing cities of Japan. In parallel, I gained a wider perspective on urban and architectural theory by reading work that had newly appeared in translation, including Rudowski's Architecture Without Architects, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown's Learning from Las Vegas, Ram Kulha's Delirious New York, and Aldo Rossi, The Architecture of the City. What interested me about these books was their attempt to explain the nature of urban space in specific cities and places. I hoped that I too would be able to write books like that someday. Wandering through the streets of Shibuya in 1991, the year Japan's asset price bubble burst, I came across an intriguing apparition, a spaghetti snack bar crowned by a baseball batting cage. I never got the chance to survey the building, it was demolished shortly after I discovered it, but this was the virtual prototype for the Made in Tokyo project. 
It set me to thinking about the building types that are specific to Tokyo, buildings defined not as a single entity but as environmental elements or hybrid assemblages that bring together otherwise unrelated functions or structures. When Arata Isuzaki invited me to participate in the exhibition Camera Oscura or Architectural Museum of Revolutions in 1996, I put forward a collaborative proposal to make a guidebook to this architecture based on the data we collected in our surveys. It took us more than four years to prepare Made in Tokyo, which was published in 2001. The book describes an architecture that, far from attempting to control the surrounding environment, is itself defined and shaped by the accidents of the site and the participation of the people who inhabit it. Pet Architecture Guidebook, published the same year, looks at very small buildings that have been customized by their owners, showing how individuals practice their own space production, breaking the general rule that architecture is a collective enterprise. I found this sense of freedom quite refreshing and became interested in exploring a method of observing and drawing architecture and urban space from the viewpoint of the people who use it, rather than the architects and planners who are involved in its construction. Using the architecture specific to a city as a basis for developing urban theories, our drawing studies expanded beyond Tokyo. Through these studies, we found that building types can offer a key to understanding processes of urban transformation. Our field of research then expanded farther, into suburbs and rural areas. In 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami was followed by meltdowns at Fukushima nuclear power plant, a triple disaster that brought untold devastation to both rural areas and cities. Working with Archiades, a relief and recovery network of architects set up immediately after the earthquake, we conducted a field survey for a reconstruction plan for the coastal region of Ishinomaki-shi. We talked to village residents about the ways of life and the landscapes that had been washed away by the tsunami and used fragments of information collected in the interviews to make drawings that reconstituted these spaces. The process was akin to putting together pieces of a puzzle in one's memory, and I began to think that we might call this way of working architectural ethnography. I thought that if we could draw up a reconstruction plan based on a thorough understanding of the village gained through the survey, then it could serve as an effective means of illustrating and realizing an entire sequence linking past, present and future. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.